yours. I'd like to call the meeting order, please. Roll call. Councilmember Chung? Here. Councilmember Power? Here. Councilmember Smith? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Pozencourt? Here. And Mayor Davies? Here. Everyone is present. Thank you. If we could all rise, please. Invocation tonight will be offered by Pastor Nick Smith from the Christian Life Assembly. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you that we have people uh, in this city who, who represent us, God, and who are, are looking out for us. God, thank you for everybody in this room. God, we thank you that uh, you have given this place to us. God, I pray for a spirit of unity. God, I pray um, for our state and local elections, and God, I pray for our national election as well. God, I pray that um, whichever happens, God, Lord, that we would still be the United States of America. God, that we would put aside our differences. Lord, that we would come together, Lord, and do what's best for the people around us. Lord, may we love our neighbors as we love ourselves. God, I pray over tonight. I pray for wisdom. I pray for your guidance. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If we could all still uh, standing, please. Uh, Justin, uh, Lieutenant Justin Wooper uh, and his explorers are going to take care of the flag salute tonight. Pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 City Council Mayor, we appreciate the time tonight to uh, focus on the restart of our Explorer program. Um, as many of you know, uh, the City of Tatchby and the Tatchby Police Department had a vibrant uh, program up until about 2020 that was well attended by the uh, local community. That program kind of went by the wayside through the COVID years. And so when the uh, chief uh, arrived here in Tatchby, one of his desires was see, to see that program restarted. So um, we began working over the last uh, probably six months or a year or so 
uh, to get that program back on its feet. And what you see tonight is the first initial six kids who volunteered to be part of this program. This is an all volunteer uh, community based program. And um, so the kids went through a, a four week mini academy where they learned about officer safety, radio codes, um, and anything uh, involving the police department and the city of Tatchby. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Sergeant Mike Adams and Officer uh, Aguilar, and Officer Kaiser, and we had several other officers who volunteered their time throughout the last four weeks of this program to really get it up and running. So uh, we're looking forward to the future now of this uh, program continuing to grow and seeing many more kids volunteer their time uh, here in the community. So I'd like to ask the chief to come up. He's gonna congratulate these kids as they come across and receive their certificates. And, uh, and then we'll do a few photos and, uh, and appreciate your time. Evelyn Smith. Sydney Rupert. Miguel Rios Salgado. Real quick before I announce our employee of the quarter, um, why this Explorer program is, I feel is so important to the police department is, you know, uh, agencies across the country talk about recruiting issues. Well, one of the best ways to combat recruiting issues is you start recruiting from the ground up. Your youth that live in your community that are committed here have families here and have established roots. And so, uh, you know, like Lieutenant Rupert said, we've got a lot of commitment from the department so I just gave the permission, but they're doing all the work, and I'm really proud that we were able to get six this quickly and up and running. And I think we've got many more to come. Kind of what the catalyst was for me is that when we went to do the scholarship last year through the foundation, we didn't get the response that I think we should. And so one of the things I did was work with these individuals, outstanding individuals in our department to help bring this program back and get people vibrant about what we're doing here and, and build some roots in, in a future department. So I think we'll have a lot of success moving forward. So council, thank you and city manager for giving me the opportunity to get that done. So next up, I wanna invite officer Zach Page, come on up. <clears throat> So a few months ago, uh, we brought back the employee of the quarter. Tony Benelli was our first. We're a little bit behind with a lot of things we've had going on in the summer and people out on vacations and some cancellations of meetings and different things. So uh, Zach Page is our employee of the quarter from May to August of 2024. And we'll have another one here soon. And I, a lot of folks know Zach. He's from Tatchby, born and raised. He's worked for the city for a, a number of years, actually started in public works and came over to the police department. And, and what I wanted to really take the opportunity to recognize Zach, this was selected by supervisors within our department. 
Um, I just sign the certificate, but ultimately it's approved by them because they work with these folks day in and day out. And they felt that Zach, uh, in his short time coming over to the PD, is really starting to take a leadership role. He's getting really involved in our traffic enforcement as we look to build upon that and get a traffic enforcement unit up within this next year. And so far, Zach's spearheading that. In addition to that, Zach is also a field training officer, uh, which you know a smaller agency like us has turnover, which we've stopped that now and we're starting to build. And so this is one of the foundation pieces that we have here, and I wanted to take the opportunity to recognize him and, and thank him for what he's doing and, and uh, encourage him to continue. And I see a lot of good things from Zach in the future in this department. Thank you. Explorers? You guys want to come on up? Come on up. Big photo. And then which do you want? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mike, Kaiser, Adriana, Justin, can you come on up? You know, I'm going to bail. I'm going to bail. Yeah. Hey, hey. yeah. They did the work. I'm going to bail out that. Okay. Okay, we'll start eyes right here. Okay, three, two, one. Okay. Okay. Here. Okay, and then for Pat, right here. Good deal. Perfect. Thank you. Any uh, family that would like to put it forward? Any, any family in the audience like to have a photo right now? We've got a mirror. I wish you'd like to. I just want to add my two cents uh, they're up there left I'm sorry but uh, I appreciate the officers that are still here and I appreciate the explorers for their willingness to get involved I think it's a great program I wish it was around when I was younger but so we, uh, we need to support these youth in today's problem so I always say young men and women you know so but I just let them know from me that I really do appreciate in the City Council their willingness to serve our communities thanks officers Consent agenda. All items listed. Thanks. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and non-contributional by city staff. Consent items will be considered at first and may be approved by one motion if no member of the council or audience wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in a listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the city council concerning the item before action is taken. Staff recommendations are in Shonen camps. Does anybody in the audience like to have anything removed from the consent agenda? Council? Motion to approve as presented. Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Chung? Yes. Council Member Power? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Token Court? Yes. Mayor Davies? Yes. 5 0 vote, motion carried. Audience and oral written communications. Uh, do we have any public comments, any emails or letters? Do we have anybody in the uh, audience that would like to have an opportunity to speak to the council? 
Sir, if you'd come to the podium, please. Sir? If you'd like to come to the podium. Okay. Could you please state your name and your area of residency, sure. please? <clears throat> My name is uh, Greg Alkire. I live in Tehachapi at the end of uh, Cummings Valley. So I'm not in the city proper, I don't think, but I uh, wanted to address the council. At the encouragement of a very close friend of mine, Jeff Schulstad, said it was important enough to bring it to the city council. Okay. If you're not aware, there were two arson events in Tehachapi in the last 10 days. And if, if I can have a couple minutes, I'd like to walk through the, quickly the sequence of events and then get into a discussion about where things went wrong. If I can, uh, on Tuesday, October 22nd, at 11, approximately 11:15 11, p.m., there was a fire started at our neighbor's property, directly next to ours, a 60-acre empty lot. Um, on Friday, October 26th, at approximately the same time, at about midnight, uh, I was woken up by my 18-year-old daughter screaming through the house that the barn was on fire, which is about 100 feet behind our home. The screaming wasn't about a fire, the screaming was about the animals inside the barn. It's a sound I will never forget. <clears throat> I raced outside with her as we tried to calm each other down before running towards the 30 feet of flames and I got her calm enough to where we could walk slowly towards it and, and thank God the horses were walking towards us about midway. She was able to calm down enough and then I went into uh, manager mode where I was guiding her to, with the neighbor that raced over, get the horses across the street to their barn. Uh, hurrying my 89-year-old grandmother, sorry, 89-year-old mother out of our home in her pajamas and her socks across the gravel into my car where I could run her to the front of the property, leave the car running and keep her safe because those flames were huge. There was nothing but brush trees between the house and the fire, although of course our direct backyard is not like that. The flames certainly could have reached the home then I uh, raced to our community gate to make sure that was open for the fire department because I had already called 911. It probably took a total of six or seven minutes for me to do all that to get to that community gate. Amazingly, Tatchby Fire Department was already coming through the gate by the time it got amazing. Their, their speed at which they got to a very hard to reach property with several fire trucks and get that fire under control was unbelievable. I left my 89 year old mom in the car for probably 45 minutes not realizing how time was passing. Luckily she's, her memory is slipping these days, I'm not sure it meant that much that she was stuck in the car that long. The subsequent minutes were chaotic, scrambling, trying to help the fire department any way I could turn the gas off on the propane tank that was 50 feet away from these giant flames that were now climbing up the back hill behind the barn and thank God the wind wasn't really blowing so it wasn't moving towards our house and there was 15 or more firemen or fire volunteers on foot climbing that hill with shovels getting ahead of it as fast as they could and more trucks coming in and just chaos everywhere. The uh, I don't know if he was a fire captain or a fire chief, but the guy with the special hat. <laughs> I kept trying to talk to him about this was her ex-boyfriend. He started this fire. He tried three days ago in the neighboring property. Uh, we know it was him. And what can we do? But I, he was taking care of business. And I kept saying to him, as soon as you're done, as soon as you can, I need to talk to you about this. This is arson. We knew it was arson. 
the boy had actually called my daughter after the first fire, almost immediately after it started, asked if she was okay, etc. So, as the fire department left, uh, my daughter and I were up all night making phone calls, documenting all the details surrounding the event as well as the suspect at the time. Uh, I ended up calling to Hatchby uh, Police Department or Stallion, I don't remember which. And my immediate instinct when things were under control at the home was to protect my family. This was twice that he was trying to kill us or whether he was trying to or not. That, that house could have easily caught on fire, the propane tank could have exploded. We're on a giant mountain just below Bear Valley Springs. It could have spread up the mountain very easily had the fire department not been so quick. Or our favorite dog jumping up when he saw the flames, which woke my daughter, which caused her to scream through the house and wake me. Thank God for great dogs. Uh, the local police department informed me that I was not in the city and I needed to call the county. Um, the, the guy in charge of the fire uh, scene uh, told me there was nothing he could do that he needed to turn it over to the arson division. Uh, he couldn't give me anything more than that and all I could think about was when is the next attack coming. As a father, as many of you are, we spend most of our energy in our lives protecting our kids from this kind of thing or protecting our kids from anything. I failed my daughter in trying to protect her from the terror that she experienced that night. Then, unfortunately, the system failed us because I couldn't speak to somebody that could tell me anything about where is this boy, is he, is he being interviewed, is he being arrested, what's happening. I had nothing and we were still panicked. We couldn't sleep, we, we didn't know where he was. And we had a barn that was nothing but ash. A barn that a great friend of the family spent four months building for us out of love and some money. Uh, and it was gone, it was disintegrated. Thank God the animals were safe. The two cats that were locked in the tack room for their safety were also safe. There is no way if, at all that those animals got out on their own. They could not have. We know they didn't have any ash on them. They had no evidence of being in a fire. They were all loose. We didn't find the cats till hours later. But whoever started the fire, and we know who, uh, let the animals out first. The fire department kept asking us to move my daughter's truck. That was kind of in the way from getting more trucks in, more fire trucks in. We tried three or four times. The keys were gone. She always keeps them in the center council, council. No offense to the council. Uh, and had somebody with her that evening when she parked the car that saw her toss them in the center council. Uh, they were gone. They were stolen. We didn't realize till two or three day days later somebody had gone through her purse and stolen her driver's license. After making multiple phone calls and not getting anywhere and basically hitting brick walls at every turn, uh, I finally reached Kern Sheriff, finally got somebody live on the phone, and they, when they heard me say that there was two fires, that there was arson, they immediately said, that's not our department, you need to talk to the arson people. And as a father, I, I couldn't believe it, that I couldn't speak to somebody that could help us figure out if we were safe or not. We didn't know. but. I understand the division between the departments. I get it. The, I said to the gentleman I was speaking with, what about theft? I thought, if nothing else, the stolen keys, okay, that's a theft. That's unrelated to the arson or not, it was a theft. He said, oh yeah, that's, that's a theft. You can fill out a form online, and he gave me the website. I spent about an hour and a half it, uh, filling out a form online for Kern County Sheriff about the stolen keys on Saturday at 4 or 5 a.m. I have not heard back. I don't think any of us want to go through what 
my family went through last weekend, ever in our lives. The worst part of it is that we were terrorized by a young man and his friend, it turns out, that was let out on bail 16 hours after he was arrested. He confessed to the crimes on Saturday at approximately 4 p.m. Went to Lairdo uh, Jail that afternoon and was released by 10 or 11 a.m. the next morning on bail. Now, I know there's a lot of complexity to the bail policies in every county. The bail was set at $50,000. Maybe that's the standard policy for arson. Arson with malicious intent maybe should be different. Arson that somebody has confessed to and stated it was about revenge maybe should be treated differently. Should they be held more than 16 hours where the family only has to come up with $5,000 to get them out and it is a threat to a community? Uh, and certainly my family. I don't understand, I'm still trying to understand how this all could have happened this way. I certainly feel that the city council would want to be aware of all this and if there's anything that the city council can do, whether it's working with the county, working with the district attorney's office, working with the Tehachapi at large or, or Kern County. Uh, politicians to see if there's something more there that can be done in these situations where it was an intentional arson, it was premeditated arson, it was malicious, it was confessed to, and he's out in 16 hours and, and a threat to our community and our kids. Uh, you know, there's Megan's Law was one of those new laws that made a hell of a lot of sense to make sure that the local communities were aware when there was a predator nearby. His, is that the right direction to take? I don't know. I just know that I failed my daughter. The system has failed my daughter. I have spent the last week, I've slept 10 hours in eight days because I'm sitting up in my family room looking out the window because my, I gotta make sure my girls are protected. I've had to hire process servers. Luckily, we've got an incredible one here in town. Uh, to locate him, to serve him the paperwork that we spent hours putting together to get a restraining order against him. That was the only thing I could do to protect my daughter. It doesn't keep him from attacking her, but at least it, he might get in more trouble if he uh, breaks the restraining order. We ended up finding him in Sunland uh, just Saturday morning with my help. I, so he. He's been served the restraining order. There's a hearing on the 18th in uh, uh, at the Kern County Courthouse uh, where my daughter is going to have to show up with witnesses and evidence to try to keep the restraining order going. I don't know what the city council can do, but I certainly felt that you would want to do something more than that would help the community and for families that have been victimized like this in these situations so that we are not terrorized more than one site. My daughter and I will never be the same. Uh, and we're at this moment, right now, there are two arsonists walking around to Hatchby, as far as I know, that were, one was charged and released the next day, the other was never charged. Um, anyway, I leave it to you to decide what the best pathway is and I'm happy to answer any questions and provide you with any detail you, you'd be interested in. Does anybody have any questions? Well, Greg, I just want to thank you for bringing it to our attention, sir, and I'm sorry that your family has gone through this. I'm glad that nobody was hurt. Uh, all that stuff can be replaced. Yeah. And here, I'm saying that, but I'm not living it, so I can't be perfectly honest with you, but I'm glad your, your daughters and your animals are safe, and you're safe. And that's what we do as dads to look after our families. And so I appreciate what you're going through and and I'll turn it over to the city manager and there's nothing a whole lot we can do being in the county, but we can share our thoughts with the people that we need to do and I'll make sure that that gets done. Okay. All 
right. Anything you can do, I would appreciate for the next guy, right? Yes, sir. It's, at this point, it's not about me and my family. It's about Mr. Smith. Just a comment. You did not fail your daughter, right? You did everything any one of us would have tried to do. So you didn't fail. So go out here tonight knowing you've done everything you can to see if there's an ounce of something that we can do to help this situation, okay? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any other public comments? You know, can, may oh, I? Yes, please, Mr. Gary. <clears throat> I wanted to reiterate. You did not fail your daughter. I was thinking that the whole time, actually. Um, I'm not even sure what I want to say. This is so unfortunate, it's not even funny, right? If that's a statement that makes any sense. The, there are political boundaries which are also unfortunate. Had this happened in the city of Tehachapi, you and your family would have been treated far differently. Um, glad to hear Kern County Fire Department was first on scene and they took care of business quickly. I appreciate that a lot. I would say don't forget to vote tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. Uh, community engagement director reports, Mr. Budge. Yeah, start things with Jessica Garner from my team. We'll make the first presentation. Good evening. I'm going to tell you guys about Tehachapi Hometown Christmas. It's our third annual uh, Hometown Christmas. It's going to bring several nonprofits, businesses, and vendors together to kick off the holiday season. It will be on December 7th between 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. Um, many of these local nonprofits, businesses that are participating will provide free crafts and activities for kids and families to enjoy. We'll also have two entertainment stages this year, um, one stage being in Centennial Plaza and one stage that will be on Green Street at Tehachapi Boulevard. Um, it'll be providing entertainment like live music, carolers, an ugly sweater contest, and photos with Santa. And then the Christmas parade will follow shortly after. Oh yeah, do you, do you want me to talk about it? All right. We, so this year we do have a new parade route for the um, Christmas parade that the Chamber of Commerce will be hosting. Yes, um, thank you so much for uh, hearing us out tonight. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to present the Christmas parade part of that wonderful day on December 7th, um, just a little over a month away, which is pretty exciting. Last year, more than 4,000 residents came out to appreciate this wonderful annual event and we had a record-breaking 50 floats. And so our wonderful connection and partnership with the city prompted some updates. <laughs> um, and so the city has invested heavily in safety and making sure that everyone um, can come and enjoy this festivity safely. And so through that investment came this parade route change. And so as you can see, there'll be staging um, all along F Street from Mulberry all the way up to Curry. And then the actual route will continue like it did, but we're gonna turn left on Robinson, left on Tatchby Boulevard, and then um, everybody will get to go right by the Tatchby train depot. And then Santa, uh, toward the end, who finishes off the wonderful parade, will be able to um, do the Christmas tree lighting immediately afterward. So we're very excited. I feel like this um, partnership is really gonna help keep everybody safe and to also handle that crowd of 4,000 plus people and residents. So um, yeah, we're very excited to be partnering again, and um, thank you so much for hearing my little presentation. And if you have any questions, let me know. Thank, thank you for your consideration. Do we, does anybody in the public have any comments? Council? Uh, what's the difference between the yellow and the blue? I'm sorry, I missed so, that. So yeah, the yellow is a staging area, and, and so we got an extended staging area, and then the blue is the actual parade. Fantastic. So everybody can start setting up to watch it. 
I'll just add, the, the change came from a public safety perspective in talking about uh, things uh, past tradition. Traditionally, the parade floats at the end of the Christmas parade being an evening, dark. The parades would return on E Street, less light, a lot of kids in the back of trailers and pickups. And in talking with Chief Standridge, our public works department, um, we identified that we could maybe make a change and do something different. So thanks to the leadership at Public Works, uh, we talked with consultants about putting together the safest possible mm -hmm. parade route uh, for the public. And it, this kind of a circular pattern allows for the parade entries as it, the parade ends basically at the tree, the Christmas tree in front of the depot, very close to the origination point, the, the staging area. So it's a very short return on Tehachapi Boulevard under controlled circumstances. Uh, we don't want anything to occur. As we saw it that happened in the city of Bakersfield last year, that was a, even as much planning as they did, there's still things that occur. So we wanted to make sure we identified any potential hazards and eliminated those things. So uh, all of our departments at the city got together to make sure that this was something we felt would be best interest of the public. So, and then we worked with the Chamber of Commerce because this is their parade and announced this is our official nighttime route. It's the only nighttime parade that we do. Uh, but because normally these are presented on consent, we wanted to explain them to you. Um, so that way you had any questions regarding the change, we could uh, answer those and not just place it on consent as we do most of our special events. So with the hometown Christmas and the shutting down of Green Street, the tree lighting at the depot and the parade, do we need to have council approved because normally it would be on consent and approved? We'll go through our normal approval. Okay. You can probably do 12 and 13 together since you just... Yeah, if so there's no objection with the council, we can do number 12 and 13 together with one motion. There's no objection. So based on that uh, staff, the chamber, we're here to answer any questions should you, uh, should you have any. So when they are completed at the, at the Christmas tree, where do the floats and everything, where, where do they go at that, from that point? So that's considered the end right there at the, at the tree, basically in front of Conan's. Then we've got traffic control in place along Tehachapi Boulevard, so there won't be any, um, there'll be a detour. So any eastbound traffic on Tehachapi Boulevard uh, will be diverted to Mountain View, and there'll be a detour in place. Uh, the crossing at Green Street will also be closed. Obviously westbound traffic at Robinson will be closed as well with a detour uh, for people to, um, to make it around. So that portion of Tehachapi Boulevard should be uh, controlled, no traffic, but it's technically the parade route ends at the tree lighting. And those parade floats can then continue back to the staging area. Well, that's what I meant. Yes. Where do they go from there? Yeah, so they'll go back to the staging area. Uh, I believe if it's, it's either Mill or Polly that they'll be able to return to, uh, Polly. yeah, on Polly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. So they'll be able to return on Polly, so that way they can, the kids can, you know, unload there. Or they can safely unload on Tehachapi Boulevard along the Conan's area if they're going to join their parents as part, per, you know, to watch the tree lighting. Okay. Great. Any other questions? No, it's looking forward to it, so. I'll make a motion on items 12 and 13. I'll second. Councilmember Chung? Yes. Councilmember Power? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Hovencourt? Yes. Mayor Davies? Yes. 5 0 vote motion carried. Great. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you to your group for working on this and being the, making it the safest that we can have. It, it's a part of the leadership team. This is something that we talk about public safety all the time. Everything that we do, we talk about safety. And uh, so with the, the leadership team in place, it was, it, it came together very easily. So thank you. thank you. Thank you, Claire, also for your diligence in this and, and Maya and Jessica. So thank you, everybody. Very appreciative of the city and, and how, how much the city has come in and really, really helped make this a very safe and wonderful event. Thank it's, you. A, it's a true collaboration. We've, we've met with Claire, also David Shaw, who's the parade uh, coordinator, and uh, make sure that they understood what our goal was and worked with, tried to work to the best that we could within the needs that they have to, uh, to stage the parade safely. Thank you. Okay. And then 
Ready for next item? Uh, yes, item 14. Clean California Community Designation Program. Yeah, so this is for your information. Uh, Public Works Director Don Marsh came across this, presented it to the executive team, and what we felt, this is a Caltrans program. It's a part of Keep <coughs> America Beautiful is the ultimate uh, program behind this. The state got involved and made this part of their Clean California initiative, which is there's been Clean California grants over the past few years. This is a new initiative that they have announced. So part of this designation program, there's 15 points, and I've listed all 15 um, in the, the report. We do almost every single one of these. I think there was 12 or 13 of the 15 we already do in working with other community stakeholders in trying to keep to have to be clean on different uh, events, cleanup events, um, in not only support but in leading some of these. So as we started to look at the criteria, Don and I felt that we've already we're doing this. Let's go ahead and and uh, you know make the pitch to to uh, to be involved, take credit for what we're doing. And then the state is going to provide us with special signage that says you are now entering a uh, clean California city uh, at the off ramps. So at being one of the first 100 cities to be involved in the program. And uh, nice thing is clean California after uh, Director Marsh brought it to my attention, uh, this, <laughs> this program actually reached out to us and said, we had been told that you were already doing these things and we hope that you jump on board and participate. So I said, well, a matter of fact, I signed the pledge yesterday and returned it. So you'll see us on that list. And sure enough, we're one of those first 100 cities to commit to it, continue to do what we do, multiple cleanup events of varying uh, sizes uh, that usually kind of kick off around Earth Day, April 22nd, weather permitting, and continue through till about October. So we work very closely with Love to Hatchby, with Caltrans, with Tatchby Area Association of Realtors, uh, Starbucks, uh, the list goes on, Salvation Army, there's different groups that want to do cleanup events and we're in. So uh, this has been a kind of a no-brainer from our perspective, but we wanted to advise you that we're gonna be participating in this program. And I think Don and I also think that this might also offer, uh, open up the opportunity for potential Clean California grants as well. There's no promise of that, but we think that there's good reason to believe that our participation might open the door for other things. So, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions from the public? The council? Bill? What are the two items we're lacking? <laughs> uh, cigarette recycling dispensers. We don't currently have those, uh, but uh, thanks to council member power, and uh, some of the things she's been doing with our uh, mural projects, uh, she's identified a couple of locations that we could. And uh, City Manager Gilbert has said, let's go ahead and get those recycling receptacle uh, it, so we can put those in place so people won't throw their cigarette butts on the sidewalk. Oh, I see. They can okay. actually put them in a collection bin. All right. I, I just, that was kind of confusing when you said that. And the other being um, an education program, uh, K through 12. We don't currently we go into the schools the pd goes into the schools and does a lot of reading with the kids and different things like that individual programs but as far as doing a recycling program we haven't done on the city wm does some things we'll probably work closely with wm to work on some of their educational messaging so we can close the gap and be 15 for 15. okay super thank you yeah. Development Service Director reports. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Sorry, let me. All right. Um, okay, so the item I have for you tonight is an agreement with Mead and Hunt Consultants to update the Tatchby Municipal Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan, or ALUCP. You'll hear me use that acronym. Um, repeatedly so uh, that's our airport compatibility plan uh, for your sake and the audience as well in case you don't know what the AOUCP is is uh, airports um, planes fly in and out right and and that can be unsafe depending upon what is located on either end of the runway and so safety so what we locate adjacent to the airport is something we ought to think about 
Um, that's the principle behind the ALUCP. It's a plan that looks at um, overlaying safety zones that are created by Caltrans Aeronautics specific to our airport and our runway alignment, and then overlaying those safety zones on the land adjacent to the airport, and then uh, putting into place some restrictions on the developments of those properties so that we have appropriate uses adjacent to the airport. So that's why the term is compatibility plan. It's about making sure that whatever is in the land surrounding the airport is compatible with the airport operation. <coughs> Again, safety being the principal purpose of the document. Um, so the city uh, municipal airport, we own the Tashby Municipal Airport, and our airport uh, was defined in 1996 along with all the rest of the airports in Kern County in a Kern County-wide ALUCP. That plan has been updated a few times in minor ways since 1996, but has not seen a major revision since that time. Um, what importantly has happened since that time, though, is, is Caltrans, as I mentioned a second ago, a Caltrans Aeronautics Division produces guidelines for how documents like these should be formed and how you ought to form the safety zones and how you ought to apply them to the properties around the airport. Um, so Caltrans made a major update, a complete change to those guidelines back in 2011. And so after that date, there began to be some reason to reevaluate our ALUCP against these guidelines. Um, so Ashley and I, in particular, have spent a lot of time talking about this subject as we've looked at development proposals on either end of the runway. Um, and a number of years ago, the two of us kind of looked at each other and said, boy, it would really be nice if we figured out a way to update the ALUCP that would make both of our jobs respectively easier and it would be a lot clearer for property owners around the airport and for airport operators to understand this relationship. And so we looked around and sought um, uh, advice from different consultants about how to do this and then we asked you all to budget for this endeavor this year, which you approved. Um, so um, what we're doing tonight is hopefully hiring the uh, consultant to do the work. So we've been working with Mead and Hunt on a number of individual projects recently looking at this issue of compatibility and we asked them to kind of give us a, a sense of what a full updated plan would look like which they provided to us about 18 months ago and so uh, we're ready to go ahead and, and produce this update at this point so um, again we reached out to Mead and Hunt uh, Mead and Hunt would coordinate efforts with city staff County of Kern Caltrans Aeronautics and other stakeholders uh, collecting necessary data to produce the ALUCP and the AOUCP looks at a number of issues including noise, overflight, safety, and airspace <coughs> protection. Um, we budgeted $200,000 to execute this work, which is a little below the running average. Uh, we've been told by a number of consultants that the typical across the state is upwards around uh, of about $250,000, but we were able uh, to work with Mead and Hunt on a budget that we believe between uh, their work and ours that uh, uh, that we can keep within that $200,000 budget. Their proposal is about $169,000. Their proposal is included in the staff report if you had a chance to take a look at it. And so we recommend um, that you approve the agreement between the City of Tatchby and Mead and Hunt for the 2025 Tatchby Airport Land Use Compatibility Plan. Um, that concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Do we have any uh, questions from the audience? Uh, council? Uh, Jay, thank you for this and to your group. I know it's very important. I think I was talking to Greg the other day. I was coming down Tatchby Boulevard. And I wasn't really paying attention, and there was an airplane right in front of me. Scared the heck out. He was landing. It okay. just caught me off guard. Right, sure. I know. That happened to me today. He yeah. overflew me when I was there. And yeah. It, yeah, yeah. I so know it kind of takes your breath away for just yeah, a second. And you go, okay, he's in the right place. Yes. <laughs> So, so, all right. But that illustrates the issue perfectly. Yes. What is happening in the land outside of the airport boundaries, but immediately adjacent to the airport. So, all right. Uh, I have a uh, need to make a motion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll move. Uh, you make a motion. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, I move that we approve the agreement between the city of Tatchby and Mead and Hunt for the 2025 Tatchby Airport Land Use compa Compatibility Plan. Uh, second. Roll Council call, Yes. Council Member Fowler? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Polkincourt? Yes. Mayor Davies? Yes. Five zero vote. Motion carried. Thank, Thank you, Jay. Jay. Uh, Assistant Manager, Assistant City Manager reports. <coughs> Mr. Corey. Thank you, Mayor Davies and Council. Uh, tonight, I have a request for a letter of support 
Many may be aware of the uh, proposed hydro store Willow Rock Energy Storage Center project. This is located um, in East Kern near Don Road between Mojave and Roseman. Um, it is, and don't I can't get into all the actual details because it's way up here, but uh, this basically uses advanced compressed air technology to store uh, excess, grid, uh, excess power from the solar, uh, wind turbines, whatever. Uh, it's out there in East Kern. It heats it up, stores it underground, and then when it's nighttime and people need power, it will be released back to the grid. Uh, it's a very innovative uh, proprietary technology that HydroStore has. This is a Toronto-based company, uh, and they are building this first of its kind project uh, in East Kern. Uh, there is a hearing, it's an informational hearing, at the Roseman Community Services District meeting this Wednesday uh, with some members of the California Energy Commission regarding uh, their proposal. We've engaged with uh, HydroStore, uh, really frankly, since the beginning of this project. They have identified Tehachapi as their, essentially their base of operations. Um, they've had their entire team from Toronto in here a couple times. They've met in downtown, they've stayed in our hotels, and, and they've basically said, hey, when we start building this thing, we expect a lot of folks to stay here, and then ultimately as well, we'll receive economic benefit from the full-time jobs that are created. These are gonna be highly skilled, engineered, highly well-paying jobs that when we see those kind of jobs created in East Kern, whether it be in aerospace, uh, you know, uh, mining, renewables, a lot of those folks tend to live here in Tehachapi. So we certainly expect a lot of impact from this project. There's also the hope that this project as well will lead to additional projects. This is sort of experimental. It's the first of its kind in East Kern, and it's a lot of open desert out in that direction. And um, from my understanding, dealing with the hydro store folks and their consultants, they're very happy about what they found in the ground uh, as far as supporting this type of development. So this could be the first of many, which will not only help, obviously, economic uh, benefits, job creation, but also we continue to struggle in California with the resiliency of our grid. We create plenty of solar energy, but what do we do at night? Battery storage is an issue, and this is one big, fancy, expensive battery, basically what they're making. Uh, so we really believe this is a project that we support from not only uh, grid resiliency, but also um, the cutting edge technology and the long-term economic benefit we'll see here in the city of Tehachapi. So uh, we have drafted a letter to be presented at this uh, informational hearing uh, coming up on Wednesday at the Roseman Community Services District building. Uh, it kind of recaps a little bit about the technology and then obviously Tehachapi having a long history in the renewable energy sector. and we. Uh, would like to get the council support for this project. Again, this is an informational hearing, uh, but there will be members of the California Energy Commission. So you can imagine doing a project of this magnitude in California is a very, very heavy lift. Uh, very, uh, there's several different commissions and boards that have to be approved before you can get to the county side of permitting and regulation as well. Uh, and the California Energy Commission will be a big part of that. So any support uh, I think we can lend will be beneficial for this project. And so um, if you can see the letter is attached, but uh, my recommendation today is to submit the attached letter uh, to the California Energy Commission in support of HydroStore's Willow Rock Energy Storage Center and authorize the mayor to sign. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Court. Do we have any questions from the audience? Council members? How does it work? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, they have a video that, I mean, basically heats it up, puts it underground, and then sends it back up later when they need. I think they drill about four football fields deep down into the, down into the earth to actually create their you know complete it's, conveyance. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It is. It is very. Is there interesting. anything like this in the world? <laughs> There's a few of these around uh, now. The technology that Hydro Store uses is a little different. So they have not been. They did get some grace from the state to not release everything because they said, hey, this is proprietary and we kind of need this to have an advantage in the market. So we haven't got all of the ins and outs from Hydro Store because they were allowed to withhold some information, but uh, there's a few of these across the world um, and there's a few across the country. Uh, but this is something that's been talked about for several years, anticipated construction, maybe 2026, um, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through still and this yeah. is one of the first steps. Did they, I have a question. Did they say how many employees they would hire? It's going to be about 85 full-time once they're building. I mean, uh, construction jobs will be several hundred. Uh, around the 400 range. Uh, these are very you know, intricate machines and, and that's, there's a lot of obviously elec electronics involved and you've got heat pumps and air compressors and uh, different, there's a lot of, you know, there's a, be a lot of dirt work needed to create the reservoir to hold the water that's gonna help cool this, this, this uh, compressed air and all that stuff. So there's about 400 construction and about 85 full-time 
and these are again pretty highly paid technical jobs and then you always think about the job multiplier effects for 85 of one of those there's probably going to be four more something else to support that job sector because it's pretty advanced you know in the in the energy world yeah. thank you Anna sorry didn't mean to cut you off <laughs> I was just curious that uh, although this is not located, won't be located within the city and uh, certainly in a county area, have they addressed any uh, danger in the surrounding areas? That's all going to be part of the very extensive sequel process yeah. when that study comes out, um, and it'll definitely be addressed in that. So we, we don't know not enough when until the process until the sequel document starts, but. These have been done elsewhere in the country, um, and so they will be obviously addressing any issues that may come up. But the good news is it's kind of out in the middle of your familiar Don Road. There's not much out there, um, and so that's why. They were initially looking at a spot off of Willow Springs Road, a little closer to uh, Willow Springs International Raceway, but when they started drilling, they ran into rock, which didn't really jive with this project. So they had to relocate, and they found a better location where the, you know, the geology is much more it's, it's much better for a project of this magnitude so yeah but all those types of details will be addressed in the secret process so thank you any other questions so is the CEQA complete no this is just the they, they haven't gone down the entire process with this yet they're going through the first steps you've got the california energy commission they also had the cpuc so they haven't started circulating the secret document yet for this project because they're not at that level yet so this is a question, not a comment. Why would you want to support something happening 30 miles from here before the CEQA is even complete? I think that one's pretty, we support things that happen 30 miles from here on a regular basis. I mean, even today we're, we approved a donation to Edwards Air Force Base on that sort on that for the flight test museum. And we obviously see a huge impact. This is in, this is more of a, we, support this project in concept until the secret document comes out and then obviously that will be opportunity to address all these issues but um, this is one where I think in concept based on what we've seen and what this project can do for a very a grid that needs some support I think definitely in concept without the secret document coming out it's safe to support something like this Motion on staff's recommendation. I'll second. <coughs> Roll call, please. Councilmember Chung? Yes. Councilmember Power? Yes. Councilmember Smith? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Yes. Mayor Davies? Yes. By zero <coughs> vote, motion carries. City manager reports. Mr. Gary. Thank you. I wanted to address the gentleman again. You're a victim twice. You're a victim of the fire fires. And you're a victim of appears to me what we struggle with at the city of Tehachapi with nearly every day, and that is the state of California's policies, procedures, and laws. And what I meant by vote tomorrow is we need to vote accordingly so that our state leadership will hear us and start to work on our behalf. Because loosening laws and letting people out of prison amongst a million other things that we deal with, the bureaucratic nonsense in Sacramento. People are fed up, and I'm fed up with fighting them, but we will continue to fight. Yeah, I was surprised doing a little bit of research online that bail is often uh, determined and set by the county and or uh, a county judge. I, I assumed immediately that this was a Sacramento bail issue, but at least well, without yeah. getting into too many details, obviously, yeah. but the county is an extension of the state government, you bet. You bet. and you they are through. required to follow state laws also. Right. So, I agree, voting can make a difference. I'm hoping there's something more that can be done. Let's hope so. Uh, on a more happier note, I, I suppose, <clears throat> our finance department has received once again uh, the GFO, GFOA award for budgeting, so very proud of that achievement. We continue to budget accordingly and uh, very transparent and it's reviewed and critiqued by an independent organization and we have achieved that milestone 
once again. So congratulations to Hamid Jones and our entire finance team and the entire city of Tehachapi. I know that we put the entire budget book in your boxes this week, so very proud of that document and thank you, Hamid, for your, your leadership on that. Uh, the second thing I wanted to talk about, and Corey mentioned it, uh, different things that we do in and around the city of Tatchby, we go into things with our eyes wide open, <coughs> whether it's the city, the county, or this entire region, or the state, quite frankly. We donated $1,000 to the uh, Air Force Association. They are raising funds to move <coughs> the Air Force Museum from the inside of the gate to the outside of the gate at Edwards Air Force Base. 9-11 changed the rules of engagement. Uh, they've got quite uh, engagement for viewership or attending going to, to uh, enjoy the museum. They've got quite the collection of Air Force um, uh, aircraft over the years. Edwards has been you know, a leader, a world leader in testing. And so uh, I thought it was the least that we could do. I know that Mayor Davies and Joan Pogancourt uh, among others, uh, attended a tour of Edwards um, a couple weeks ago, and um, very impressive what they do, obviously. Uh, we all know that, but uh, it's important that we continue to support our military. Uh, the next thing is, speaking of military, uh, today we obviously had our, our mural dedication. I'll leave that to you, but we have a Veterans Parade on Monday, uh, Veterans Day. The parade starts at 10. Uh, goes along um, F Street. They are staging on Green, and then at 11 11 a.m. at Central Park, there will be a, a short ceremony to honor our vets. So if you can, please join us on Monday. And then uh, coming up here on the 14th of this month, we have our Special Olympics Torch Run. I know Chief last year uh, led that group. It was a great group of individuals. We out of Centennial Plaza, is that right? Is it again this year? Centennial <coughs> Plaza yeah. at 11 a.m. So come and support the Special Olympics and Tatchby Police Department and how the city of Tatchby supports all of our citizens. What date was that, Greg? That's sir. on the 14th of November. Thank you, sir. At 11 a.m. in the morning, Centennial Plaza. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. All right, if a uh, <coughs> council member reports, uh, Jeanette? Uh, sure. Uh, so today, we, as Greg mentioned, we had uh, the unveiling of a mural done by Mark Pistana, who is just, just an, an amazing background and knowledge. He's one of those individuals who <coughs> is a retired colonel from the Air Force. He was a pilot, he was an engineer, and he is a fantastic artist and just a great man. He's lived here for like 26 years, I believe, raised his children here, and has been an active volunteer in our community. But today he, we unveiled his mural uh, called um, uh, well, Defined for Freedom. Defense of Freedom. Thank you. Just, I couldn't read my hand right. Defense <laughs> of Freedom. Uh, he, he recently just named that, so we're, we're getting used to that. Um, it was a, a nice turnout. Thank you to the city of Tehachapi, <laughs> and thank you Public Works for making that very safe. That double barrier was absolutely needed. Uh, at first, might have been seemed a little big, but it was absolutely, absolutely needed and a good standard for the future. Um, and then, just for the rest of the murals, um, all of the murals will be cleaned, repaired, and restored, with the exception of two, uh, by the end of this month. Great. Actually, ten days. Yeah, people, the new one will be um, uh, st the repairs start tomorrow. Thank you. I wanted to just tell you I appreciate everything you're doing for well, the city. You. And yeah. It's amazing to go there and see the history and right there and to see some of these people in these murals that I know personally after being here for 45 years. It's just awesome what you're doing well, thank with you. your group. I want to just applaud you for that. Thank you very much. All right. I appreciate that. Mr. Smith? I think we've had a meeting since we, a group of us went on the tour, correct? It's the first one since. Yes, so uh, several of city folks uh, myself, Jay, Key, Maya. Um, were there some others from the city? Jessica. Jessica, you got to go. Don. And Don, on the uh, on the. Corey, sorry. Your energy summit. This is the oh, sorry. the uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> California Transportation Commission, <coughs> Bakersfield uh, was the host city, uh, I think on the 16th and 17th of October. And uh, a good way to get their interest peaked to come to our city or to the city down there uh, was to offer a, a scheduled trip on the BNSF, uh, their business train pulled by some really cool painted locomotive, locomotives and an antique uh, rail car uh, set up. And we were able to get on in Bakersfield and traverse all the way up the, uh, the line through the loop and stop into Hatchby, wait a little bit, and go back down. And the point of the trip is to uh, point out transportation needs that uh, we they are responsible for the, the money spent on all of our highways and some of the and some of the uh, any th things like freight movement. So we were there to discuss with commissioners face to face that are typically in Sacramento. They uh, meet. I'm not sure how often they meet. Is it quarterly? Every two months. Every two months. Uh, <coughs> but there's a lot of money at stake when uh, when they have their meetings. Uh, billions and billions of dollars. So we were able to meet with them and, and point out our our desires and needs. A meeting a few months back, we were able to convince them to fund the truck climbing lane, the middle section, and then the, the rehabilitation of 58 between here and Caliani to the tune of $257 million, the truck climbing lanes with a portion of that. And to remind them uh, that the, there's two other segments on Highway 58 for, for that need addressed. Uh, I was on the current council of governments, and uh, 20 years ago, it was pointed out by Caltrans the need for the truck climbing lanes, and finally, 20 some years later, we got the first, the middle segment of three, funded. But this this particular trip was to be able to meet them one on one, and just go over our local needs. And then the second day, I was uh, I was thrilled to be on. Uh, was it the second day or the first? One of, in one of the two days, I was uh, invited to be on a helicopter tour uh, with some of the commissioners, and we had three helicopters fly out of of uh, Meadows Field area. We got the ride on the, the brand new sheriff's helicopter. Very nice. Had headphones, uh, and we were able to speak with them one on one. We flew out over. For example, the Wonderful Company, which is a conglomerate of where all the distribution centers located to the west of Bakersfield. So they could get a, literally a, an aerial view of what's happening on the ground in that area. All this distribution, the freight movements, and the, and the you know, you have Amazon, we flew over that. Uh, you know, you've got Target, and uh, you know, we flew down to the great base of the grapevine where you've got Ikea and a number of other distribution centers. Then we flew up the backside beyond uh, Stallion Springs and, and came out to the east of Tatchby and came down to our area and then flew down back to, to Bakersfield. And to point out, and we could you could see Highway 58 right in, this is where all this freight movement has to go. And there's new distribution centers that are gonna go in that need to come up through Arvin, and they come out of 223, and they add in, they flow into to the uh, Highway 58. So it, we were able to demonstrate, you know, visually and personally the need for their support on any kind of transportation infrastructure monies that, that they have, you know, that they have to, we compete with everybody in the state. So you're, you're competing with El Segundo, Los Angeles, the Bay Area, all of the, those folks with millions of people, with millions of needs, millions of dollars. But look, freight moves from California East right through 58. So, and it's a, so I think we had a very productive uh, visit with them over a two day period. And uh, we look forward to uh, having some more conversations with them. Jay, do you know if the, there, there was a couple of local funds that we were hoping to get, do you know if they funded those? Yeah, each of the items before the CTC for Kern County were approved at that meeting. Not necessarily out of our expectation, but it was an important opportunity to talk about 
this this group might be about uh, the continuing efforts to complete the interchange between the 58 and the 99 in Bakersfield. Correct. Some of those motions are still <coughs> missing, and so that is the current focus of, of the call right now is to is to find the remaining funds for for that full interchange. So yeah, that benefits us up here as we absolutely go that way. As you recall, the uh, inter the West Side Freeway was completed. But there, not all the on and off ramps were there, so there was two more movements, as they call them, to be funded. Uh, the seventh, I think, was already funded, and we were looking for the eighth, and they, they were able to get that. And did some local money, additional money for this Caltrans, did they get that? Uh, for, uh, for the. Uh, oh, yes, yes, the additional money to finish the design on the truck. They added 10 million to the truck climbing. For the truck, the truck climbing, yes. Right. Okay, there was more money needed for design. Correct. Uh, on segment two, correct? That's right. All right. So that was also funded. So uh, very productive and happy to report all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Hannah Brand, I'm sorry, Hannah. No, I don't have anything. Um, I just thank you for all your work on that, Phil. Um, I know when I come up from Bakersfield and there's a small accident or something, the backup on the traffic going east from Bakersfield with the trucks is amazingly beyond what I ever dreamed, you know, with the backup, it's terrible. So I'm just looking forward to our passing lane, except for the fact that when they start it, I don't know how they're gonna maneuver everything. It bothers me to no end, but thank you for all your work on that. I know it's yeah. been a lot of long process, and I noticed there's lots of work on curbs and gutters, in, the, in town and uh, road improvements, and it's very well, it's very much appreciated. And on the uh, Pistano mural, my favorite plane was on there from um, Edwards, and it's a quite, it's a beautiful piece of work on this electrical cabinet, you know, and it, you need to stop and see it. It's really great, thank you. I personally like to thank my fellow council members for all the work that they do for the city. Uh, when you sit in this position, you get to see everything that everybody does, and there's a lot of, a lot of due diligence, a lot of hard work. Our city staff, our city manager, assistant city manager, and all the work that they do on our behalf, as me as a, a member of this community, uh, it really just gives me a, a warm heart to be part of this association. Uh, today at the uh, unveiling of the mural. Uh, Mark, uh, the artist, and my father were talking, and they, they found out they both were in Okinawa at the same time, and they both went to Edwards at the same time, a long time ago. So a small world out when it comes to that. And these two guys got to meet and got to talk today and uh, uh, their service to our, our country. Uh, I want to appreciate everybody uh, coming tonight. Uh, just one other thing I want to say, just make sure you get out there and make your voice heard tomorrow. It's very important that we do that. My father told me something when I was younger that if you don't vote, you can't gripe. So I gripe, okay, because I vote. Thank you, everybody. We'll adjourn to closed session. If we have anything to report, we'll come back to report after. Thank you, everybody.